Last week I was in Adelaide at the uh, Urban Development Innovation Summit and we had a, a variety of uh, speakers there. It was about how smart cities can be um, fired up with the different ecosystem around different building um, um, policies, different access to renewables uh, for those buildings. Um, I was able to sit on a panel with uh, Richard Turner from Zen Energy and Zen Energy has merged with Simac um, and Gopta uh, Foundation. Um, they're going to have a very large uh, solar farm and a very large battery in South Australia. Um, it'll be the largest in the world, I think, when it's finally built. It's going to be quite amazing. The, uh, the showcase that we did there was just to try and provide some innovation, and I was able to showcase um, this concept of securitizing uh, solar energy turning it into a type of cryptocurrency or what we call a crypto asset. And that's what Solera does. We democratize access to solar energy. And uh, if I get through the disclaimers, you may hear about investing. This is not investment advice. The lawyers say I have to say this, okay? So, um, if you do want to invest or participate, then come and see me later. It's a private discussion. So that's where we are with that. So where are we with this uh, energy market? And uh, we know there's some disruption. There's people in the government uh, on one camp that are really trying to tear down what is this uh, aspiration for using renewables in, in Australia. The NEG um, really seems to be a, a bastardization of policies and the stance of that. Um, uh, it, I could use more uh, adjectives, but uh, I won't. And uh, what we're really seeing is that we're, we are really below grid parity. You can install a solar panel and have storage. Most locations around Australia are cheaper than uh, buying it off the grid. Um, so you do need some capital for that, you need a, a credit rating for that, and you need to have an availability to, to pay off that uh, particular solar installation. So what could you do for one third of the population? One third of the population are millennials. They may not ever have or own Sydney property, given the property um, uh, st status right now. And what we're really doing is allowing millennials, or people that rent, to own solar, just like you, who might be in the crowd, that have solar and a roof right now. By owning a token, and by using the property rights discipline of Australia, we give legal perfection that that token, that mathematical certificate, is the same as owning title, legal title, to a piece of solar. And by owning title, you actually get the rights to the offtake of that solar. So this is uh, an extension of what Australia does very well already with water rights on land title. We're taking solar ownership and offtake rights for that solar. And we think that to deploy this type of innovation, we have to provide a, a type of access to information um, that is behind the meter, and that's what Solera does. Solera provides a, a sensor that goes on a solar panel between the junction boxes. You can pass it around and have a look at it. Um, I happen to be the CTO, so I have a, a technical problem most of the time. And what we really do, despite the, the fonts not working when we transferred the, uh, my file to the computer, we provide higher quality data, interval data, off the solar panel behind the meter. We also provide a way to shape the information that comes off that data into a financing package so that we can crowdfund solar using blockchain tokens and a new type of uh, information structure for crowdfunding of, of solar using uh, a type of what's called ICO or token sale. We reduce the barriers to participating in, in green investment and we also uh, provide a, a liquidity in the marketplace that is totally different than normal green funding. Normally when you invest in a solar farm, maybe a community energy project, you're locked in for seven or ten years. This is how most of the uh, pricing models and uh, if you're buying or, or selling energy off a solar farm you're locked in for a seven year or ten year sort of offtake. By having tokens we can give the participants in our solar projects um, a liquidity in a secondary market. So you get the participation rights of owning units in the solar farm but you still have a liquidity capability to sell or exit your investment in a secondary market and this is what tokens and the token economy provide. As well, we, we provide a fidelity of data that is independent of the smart meter at the barrier of your home. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard of the horror stories of people supersizing their solar farms 
on top of the roof and then having an argument with Origin about the smart meter not being accurate, that they are in fact producing and using an excess of energy 24-7 in their home. And then when they um, try and explain this to the uh, energy provider, they go and replace the, so the, uh, the smart meter and say pay the bill. There's no forensic grade data that you can use behind the meter to say that this is what I produced, this is what I use, and this is uh, secure and has not been tampered with. And that's the type of data set that we, we provide. We provide this by using a, uh, a little Solera hardware module on the uh, solar panel. And I'm going to say that the fonts are not working that well, so I'll, I'll excuse this. Uh, So the sensor that you're passing around, I hope to get it back. Um, we provide this energy provenance that the electrons came from a renewable and clean resource. That we, we track the losses through the system and we're able to calibrate your system. Now every system is a, is a loss uh, <coughs> network. There is some losses, but before it goes this through to the boundary meter, we'll, we'll have that accounting. and It'll be high resolution accounting. That data quality that we provide allows us to do forecasting of dispatchability from your solar uh, panels and also in concert with a storage device that you may have in your home. You may aspire to have a, sol uh, a battery paired with your solar panel. And also there's this no-fly zone of funding for solar projects. The, uh, the Mac Bank end of town won't get out of bed for anything, uh, I guess, smaller than 50 megawatts. And if you really do something bigger, then you're into quite sophisticated capitalization to make a project bankable is an expensive pro process. And community energy projects, more than 100 kilowatts, or uh, between that sort of 100 kilowatts to 50 megawatts, are in this uh, uh, missing zone of skills and uh, needing to formalize a financial structure and a legal structure for ownership and offtake rights. Even if it's a private company with 19 people, then the company that's owning the solar, solar farm would be the 20th. And you can only raise money in the Australian marketplace up to $2 million for that. So that really limits the scope of the projects that you can really um, architect. So our tokens allow that sort of creativity. Again, we, we established this distributed route of trust. Every panel is its own meter. And every neighborhood panel looks at the other panel that's beside it and says, are you telling the truth? These are called witness proofs. We enable the solar panel owner to share um, this data and sell the data to third parties that might be interested in it. We don't snarf the data and turn your solar panel into our product. You have the rights to your data and you have the rights to your electrons. So this is the innovation. Um, this Solera hardware module has a SIM card in it and it does the defense crypto that uh, really I came to Australia and was headhunted for, um, to provide this crypto on the panel. And Moore's Law has been very good to security and the uh, internet industries, because the, to make a device like that uh, about 20 years ago was going to cost us about $40. Now we're into the 40 cents. So the, to make a device like this uh, for a solar panel at scale really will only cost us about a, a buck a chip, including all the software licensing and the inventor um, that, that we're uh, negotiating with. So how does this scale? We certify the electrons as they come off the, the panel. Every minute there's a little heartbeat of data that comes off the panel. That heartbeat of data, that metadata, is signed cryptographically using this blockchain proof. And this blockchain proof is immutable. It links to its prior blockchain proof, links to its prior blockchain proof, and the sensor, once it's installed and your panel's commissioned, creates for its whole life cycle a very long chain of truth of the data that's been created off that panel. This is forensic grade data, and people say, why do you go through the expense of this? Well, we, we don't really are, aren't going through any expense, it's just math. We're using math and physics in a very concentrated effort to provide truth. What came off your panel? So we can certify the electrons, we authenticate the data as it goes through your inverter, through to the battery and to load devices. 
So eventually our vision is to bring these little sensors, not just on the solar panel, but downstream to smart plugs, downstream to, um, we see an air conditioner here in the room, so we can do demand management from that uh, actual device. And then downstream, providing access and information for energy trading. If we have pop-up utilities on everyone's roof and storage beside everyone's roof, then we can offer a community nodal pricing where someone may not be at home and not using their energy. They may set out a discount compared to someone who is going to have kids come home at four o'clock. It's a winter's night and uh, they want energy. So why can't they take that energy from the neighbor rather than from the grid? And that's the sort of ecosystem that we're building. It's not just for peer-to-peer -peer energy, though. It's really for providing this prominence and ongoing proof of existence. So our vision is to take this um, service capability in Australia, make it work for solar communities and solar farms, and then palletize and provide that expertise in developing countries. The World Bank has $2 trillion worth of bonds where they want to provide green energy, solar farms, renewable projects, but they have no transparency as to were those assets deployed, are they existing now, is there a proof of life, you know, from a, from a reporting and audit and verification point of view. We provide proof of life, the panel is alive, it has a heartbeat. We provide that proof of existence that the panel has since it's been installed, this long chain of truth of sensor data. And we provide forecastability Here's the output of the panel that you could enter into a contract for futures from your solar farm. This is very important as we go from base load power to variable renewables. We want to know firm dispatchability of your solar panels. How firm is that? We need a lot of data to figure that out. It'll be cross-correlated <coughs> with weather data, cross-correlated with other load data, and your neighborhood will have its own little, let's say, coefficient fiddle factor to figure out is your neighborhood going to use it locally or are you able to dispatch that for other downstream grid purposes. <coughs> so I'm going to tab through this a little animation and you can see the fonts and the, uh, <laughs> the uh, slides aren't quite right. So what happens if we're monitoring what's happening uh, in your microgrid at home we can actually track your usage and we can offer you a discount. Shift your load, don't turn your air conditioner on at 3 p.m. today, or set it at 25 degrees, not 18 degrees, and you get a demand management credit. In fact, we can provide that credit like a cryptocurrency and it will go back to your phone and you can spend it like money. It does not end up like a discount on your bill from some future bill um, where you don't know where your behavior provided this discount. So this is where demand management programs can be harnessed. We also provide privacy. We don't harvest your activity data and by dragging back all of your uh, private information from home to a central cloud for origin to, um, let's say, grok what's happening. Um, are you at home or are you not? So we want to make sure that no one can use the data from your electricity meter or from your load devices to determine if they can burglarize your home. So this is a, a critical thing. Your privacy is what we keep uh, pristine. And there's a number of ways to deploy this in solar gardens, in uh, townhouse or apartment complexes. We're really looking for gated communities, more than 100 units right now. Uh, we want to get million dollar to $2 million projects for the smaller size and then up to 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts for the larger sizes for the solar farm engagements. So really what we do is provide this tokenization. In a way we imbue property rights into the panel and the math provides this very long data log of truth. What happened every heartbeat gets signed cryptographically. And you need a supercomputer, or in fact a quantum computer, to entangle all of that and provide some sort of way to defraud our system. And this kind of math and uh, physics capability is near free because of the way that Moore's Law has happened. We're not really burning a lot of energy in order to provide this to tokenization. Some cryptocurrencies use energy as a way to do proof of work. They burn electrons to create blockchain math. We 
provides sensor proofs on top of solar to provide an energy generative blockchain. And that's our really uh, point of difference. We provide a way that we don't burn or boil the ocean in order to create blockchain services. So what happens? We create liquidity by having a secondary market. Tokens can be held and traded globally. Someone in China with $1,000 can invest in a solar farm in Nimbin and have that capability. Now the Nimbin solar farm may not have the same yield if it's a hippie commune as a Mac Bank solar farm in the middle of country New South Wales. So he may want to sell those tokens to somewhere else and provide another type of uh, yield on his portfolio. We're really creating a marketplace of solar projects and this marketplace allows peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading and collaboration and allows us to orchestrate industry signals and communication to optimize the output for community needs and ultimately for grid stability. So you would have heard about crowdfunding, um, something called Power Ledger. Um, there's been WePower, there's another group called um, we start energy, and uh, there's uh, another group around the world. Uh, one, one is called uh, Grid Plus, and there's been a number of crowdfunding projects that have made this possible. This uh, crowdfunding process is not just uh, like floating a company on the stock market. Crowdfunding by using tokens is what we're looking at doing. So, in fact, what we're doing is providing crowdfunding by offering, like Ford Project Finance, a sole token. There's a billion soul tokens that we are going to have in a contrived economy. We sell each one of those at a certain fraction of cryptocurrency, and we pool those funds and provide forward finance for our development of our, of our project. These Solera tokens, or soul tokens, are like a smart card on a set-top box from Foxtel. Now, what does that smart card on the Foxtel box do? It turns on the infrastructure so you as a subscriber can use and watch Foxtel content. Our soul token goes into that little sensor and it turns it on and enables your solar panel to provide energy for the community to use. This is the same sort of um, parallel as using a smart card and a set-top box. So by using the soul tokens we create an economy. It's a virtual and digital economy to give legal ownership of the solar panel and carve it up in little slices that each one of the, the audience members could hold a piece of solar panel. Now you don't hold one panel and you hold another panel. We virtualize all of the panels and you hold a virtual segment of that panel. Because if one panel fail, I don't want you to suffer. So the um, failure and maintenance schedule of a solar farm is apportioned equally around the crowd. So the maintenance and the uh, quotient for a solar farm to manage their yield, do proper maintenance and, and debugging of solar uh, panels and when they fail is part of the quant score and the yield management on a solar farm. And that's the other sort of uh, attestation that we want to be able to provide. Is the panel on? Is it does it have a heartbeat? What is the maintenance cycle of the solar farm? Is it well maintained? Um, and what's the um, type of performance that is happening even from one panel type of vendor to another panel type of vendor? So we're creating a new type of collaborative marketplace. This is a marketplace for electrons. Now the electrons have to be settled locally. We're not selling electrons from Australia to Japan yet. Um, and we then have a data marketplace. Your data, how your panels perform, how you use energy in the home or in the community is also a very useful data set. Over the next 10 or 20 years, that'll be a premium data set because we have very high resolution data, per minute data. Right now, the NEM is uh, trading at 30 minutes with five minute updates. And they're going to move to five minute updates, interval data for trading of energy and we're going to have greater resolution than the, than the NEM. And that provides us with a very sound bit of data for doing machine learning and ultimately artificial intelligence. We want to be able to give consumers a, a little bot on your mobile phone that you'll be able to set and forget. If I want to buy green energy when the wind is blowing, 
our little bot will charge your battery to do that. If I want to export energy when for the two hours in the shoulder on my time of use tariff, I can do that before the kids come home and make sure that uh, we, we have enough energy left over um, to, to have a warm bath. So th those are the sorts of AI bots that this type of data will provide. So what's the utility of a SOL token? It turns on the infrastructure, provides this proof of insulation. We call this proof of fusion, the heartbeat coming off the solar panel. It's the proof that the sunlight hit the panel. And then we aggregate that with an accumulator. On the data side, if you want to bid on my data where the Solera panels are installed, then you have to offer money for my data set, and then I accept that. But in order to stop people from creating fake offers or dummy bids, if everyone's been to a property auction, you have to make sure that someone puts something at risk when they bid, that if, they, if the bid's accepted, there's actually something that they have to deliver on. That's the other reason why the sole token is there. Now, we're not the only crazy startup thinking about this. So we are creating a type of energy bus and a information bus. So along the sort of energy being harvested and data on solar panels and data on downstream devices, there's standards for doing this. In California, they have a, they have a, um, a type of industry SCADA standard that is now being engaged where the inverter provides the logic for switching between should the panel store uh, energy at the home or should it be exported to the boundary meter. There is no standards that have been embraced in Australian uh, electricity grid that I know of where they're going to harmonize this across different vendors and across the industry. We plug into that type of standard and it's called the IEEE 2030.5 CA rule and there is a brand new SunSpec alliance as well for how solar panels will engage with that. This is our kind of best of breed target for how we want to build our solar infrastructure and make it work on any vendor so that you can have a mixed match uh, multiple vendor set across a community and still be able to have dispatchability and hard data that works when you expect it to work. So when I send a signal to say to an inverter to say dispatch electrons out the meter that they will come um, with some sort of ramp up time and they'll, they'll be expected and, and delivered at, um, accordingly. This information for prosumers is very, very palatable. You will be able to make very rich applications as far as providing detailed audits on energy use around the home, but also for scheduling and tar targeting the energy shifting, uh, time shifting loads, and providing energy arbitrage. For the community, it provides a way to balance a smart city, and also for the grid providers, it allows you to orchestrate loads across different uh, time periods during a day or maybe different weather events. So this, this is the type of architecture that we're doing. And this has come from the Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. They've created a foundation where they want to provide energy systems that can transact, like smart devices can do digital transactions. So energy right now is a type of circuit switched system. You've got to plug up, um, some sort of copper cable in to get your energy and move it from A party to B destination. Just like the internet has disrupted communications, you, we used to have a plain old telephone service where you have one party A would call party B and the copper would be connected in a virtual switch to make that uh, call happen. Just like you have packetized information, energy systems will start to look more and more like a piece of the internet. I'll be able to send uh, payloads of energy down the line and I won't need to know all of the different uh, interconnects and load balances between that, I'll know it will go from my source to its destination and the network will take care of it. So how are we going to get there? We're, we're taking baby steps. We are doing this out of the lab. We have some friendly solar farms that we're working with. One of them is called Singleton Solar Farm. It was uh, connected by Osgrid. It was a distressed asset and someone has refactored it. It's uh, now just outside of uh, Newcastle. It has uh, 400 kilowatts of panels right now. It's upgradable to 4 megawatts, maybe 5. Um, and that has an offtake agreement that we'd like to help. So we're going to provide proof of insulation and proof of existence on these types of solar farms. 
Then we provide a way to <coughs> anchor what's happening on the net, these five minute intervals where you don't know what the energy system is on the, on the uh, national electricity network. And what we're going to do is offer people a green signal so that you can decide, is the electrons green? Should I store? Or do I have all excess energy? Can I still export? Right now in South Australia, where I spent most of my uh, two decades, two and a half decades here in Australia, we have, the price has gone negative, the wind is blowing at night, and it's green all around. We're exporting energy. On a time of use tariff, I could recharge my battery in the middle of the night, and I could then run my solar panels during the day, full export, just making sure I have reserve for when the family comes home. So there's a whole bunch of ways that this will create consumers as energy producers for grid-scale delivery. Um, this requires information where we look at the NEM and we provide that information like a lighthouse, it's a public service. By oracleizing the NEM, we'll be able to share this information. Only people that know what this industry signal is um, really can deal with it now. So right now on the, on the web, you can go and look at Open NEM, and there's a range of people that are experts in the industry that provide that service as a computer API. But it's not a universal API that everyone can plug into. Um, the NEM provides this as an API, but it's not easily accessible. What we're trying to do is provide this accessibility. We also are providing crowd, crowd campaigns and going to engage with communities to bootstrap using this technology to become experts at crowdfunding solar panels and solar communities and solar farms. So the cost of capital for running a solar community will not be 9 or 10 or 12 percent per annum. Most communities will say, if you can give me 5 percent, I'll sponsor the, the footy club to have LED lighting, to have uh, extra hours and to have uh, a reasonable uh, upgrade in, in the facility. And those community energy projects really need that type of engagement without the cost and heavy lifting of most financial structures and the capability that uh, is possible with blockchains makes it as easy as participating using a mobile app. Finally, our loads and offtakes from, from the uh, grid in a, in a disaster or, or cold start scenario. And we're getting pretty close to the end. So how we really structured ourselves, we're a startup, we're 18 months old, we're um, spent most of our money, we got some R&D back, we now need a little bit more money to, to grow to the next level. We're raising a million dollars in equity, that's a private placement. You have to be a high net worth to do this, it's not a, a, a retail offer. We're also offering tokens um, and we're in discussions with a range of industry players that uh, uh, participate in these sorts of token markets. Uh, they are Chinese, Asian and also in Switzerland. There's a range of, of marketplaces that, that do this. And then we're also, once that uh, pre-sale is done, we will be doing a crowdfund. So you may have seen DC Power um, that uh, did a crowdfund for a solar-based retailer. And there's uh, some new, new ones coming to market as well for crowdfunding of solar. And we'll, we will be helping people go through that experience. Eventually we need access to traditional uh, slabs of money. One solar farm, 100 megawatts is $120 million. So we do need to go to the traditional side of the market to get involved with those sorts of builds. But we think we can get started quite small. We want to keep it under uh, Australian control. Um, and uh, that's really where we are from, a, from an investment and uh, capitalization. If you're familiar with tokens, um, this uh, sort of diagram would, would be uh, quite comfortable for you. Um, but this is how the round of investment happens. We, we really share a percentage of the tokens with the founders and the people that took the risk early. The team gets 10%, so it's like owning a, an employee share. But it, you don't own a share, you own a token. And we help um, and uh, provide export ser expert services by, by getting uh, people to help us with the, uh, the crowd sale and the to token sale as well. So there's a, a whole crowdfunding campaign that ramps up and it will probably take us six to eight weeks to do for a, pu a public roadshow and it will be uh, global. Um, we hope to raise about $50 million. Our soft cap will be around 15. Now, this is the fun bit. We are in the sunniest place in the world. I do not know why we don't have energy in abundance here. This is absolutely crazy where we are today. 
the, we, we should be able to say we don't want this dystopia that we're heading into where there's some sort of Blade Runner future that looks plausible, all right? We really think that this is the best place in the world to build this kind of attitude that we call solar punk, where the communities take charge of their own destiny, they can provide this uh, fertile service um, arrangement where everyone helps each other, they provide the roof and the, the expertise to, to share the energy back and forth, and we should be able to, with energy, even have water in abundance here in Australia. You know, if we have the energy, we can have the diesel plants. We can provide the, the services that we need. So we really see that there should be energy abundance and Australia should be the, the best place to do it. The reality is, why is Tesla here? This arbitrage between price and cost of production is an extremely attractive thing for an entrepreneur to, to play in. Because I can make any mistake um, and probably still have six to eight months of burn, ra burn rate to make, make a, my, my business successful. So the, the price arbitrage right now um, is, is extremely attractive. That's why a lot of innovation and entrepreneurs are trying to do smart energy and solar and storage projects here in Australia. It's really an outlier for the rest of the world. And that's really it. And I'll take some questions. We do have a suitable team. I'm, uh, I've been in the industry for crypto and, and embedded devices for 25 years. We have a range of um, bankers and financiers that can help us structure the company and bring it forward. And uh, on the uh, team side, we have a range of people. One of, one of our uh, master's um, students is in, in the crowd. We have a, a range of advisors. One of them is moving from Europe. And uh, we're, we're really providing a, a, a whole ecosystem around Uni New South Wales and also uh, Flinders University in Adelaide will be our two sort of research areas that we, we roll out from. Thank you very much, Leon. Fascinating presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, could you um, give a bit more insight into how uh, a householder would go about tuning their system, uh, deciding what, what trade-offs to make and how, how they might get advice from the system hmm. of, of time shifting and so on? So the, the consumer would have an in-home display, if a, a prosumer type scenario, so this would be a, a tablet type interface, and they'd be able to say, I'm on this time of use tariff from my energy retailer, if I, have a, if I have an incentive to hold back some electrons, I can make a little bit of arbitrage on the shoulder where the, we all know that the energy is, is needed and uh, more earnest around the 3 p.m. to 8, 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. kind of mix. So that little arbitrage um, bot would allow you to say, from the periods of the morning to maybe 2 p.m., I want to maximize my export, leave a little bit of reserve in my battery in case I do the laundry, and from there, I want to make sure that I have enough in the evening to, to use my own energy locally and maximize what I need for the, max, for the, the shoulder price or the, the maximum price that I would get. Right now, you don't know from the smart meter or, or from your own time of use tariff what is happening in a five minute interval. There's no way to easily do that. Most smart meters let you have access to the data a day later, but it doesn't let you help you today. So this is, the re this is the information arbitrage, which is really perverse, right? They, they hold back the data, and they, 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 want to, they want to keep on selling you more energy. What we're trying to do is give you the tools to be able to um, select what you want to do according to your lifestyle and your own behavior. It wasn't quite what I was asking. I was really asking about uh, how the system might advise the household. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm not a machine learning or AI guy, but the, the scenario would go something like this. After three months of, of uh, run-in time, we would pick some sort of um, normal pattern of your household um, through a number of weeks, and then we'd say, okay, here's our suggestion. Let's say, would you like to make 5% uh, on the energy that you could export from the time period of 8 to 2 p.m.? Um, so 8 in the morning to 2 p.m., as soon as the sun comes up, you could be maximizing your energy. And it would provide little recommendations, and it would be a click and forget, set and forget type of bot on your smartphone. And that's the sort of interface that, that we would look to provide. Okay. 
So if you've seen the banks are coming up with these chatbots, we, we want to provide you a product that you know you can save money on your interest on your home. These kind of chatbots will, will be the, the advisors for your financial um, uh, packaging and customization of, of those services. Yeah. To, to achieve that in, the, in this household, mm -hmm. you, you Solara will have put chips under every panel. So the homeowner, if, it, if they already have a solar panel, they would need to do a retrofit. Um, this fits into the optimizer circuitry. So we're, we're really looking to work with uh, panels that have optimizers, um, either at the string level or at the per panel level. Um, that, that's the sort of um, interface that we're looking at. If you've seen the reposit boxes or green sink, or another company is called Edge Electrons, we would have a node near the inverter that would do that same sort of accumulation of the data. So we will stay on the left side. The, the interface with uh, the, um, the retail. Mm -hmm. So you said before that they'll install the smart home. So you've got even more, more data. Granularity to yep. your information. So if you're going head to head with them, um, how are they going to respond? Because it's their information is what they're giving to the customer. And so, the customer requires their cooperation. Sure. So, so I think I think the business of being a retailer is going to change. As the customer has more information, they have the they have the information that the retailer needs. If if the customer has the battery and the and the um, personal decision to be able to enable dispatchability, then that retailer is going to need to enter into a bargain with the consumer to say, I need your bat your your electrons in your battery. Uh, but at the moment, all the power rests. Retailer. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That's because there's not not enough uh, bargaining power or innovate innovation behind the meter to allow this type of arbitrage to occur. Yeah. So how do you intend to uh, break the power? So the to break the nexus. 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 Yeah. So so we're not the only blockchain company that aspires to this. So there is a company called NOC that want to be, be a next gen retailer. Um, I think they presented here at Energy Lab last week. Um, Powerledger are doing some deals where they're in, embedded themselves with Origin and they're trying to be the innovation arm of Origin to allow these types of community uh, scheduling of energy back and forth. Um, if you spend some time and, and watch a video by Jeremy Rifkin, he talks about the, the third um, economic um, uh, wave and the Jeremy Rifkin talks about this data being uh, able to be used uh, by the retailer to not just sell you energy, but to provide grid stability. So the fact is, is that the energy retailer needs your electrons in these sorts of days in order to provide that capability. Right, so the information is power. Correct. And at the moment, it's, it's all stacked to the retailer because yes. they provide access to the grid. Correct. And so, so we've got an interest in trying to slow that down. Same as the banks and open banking. So I could I could build the same parallels, right? So open banking is now going to be legislated in Australia, right? The banks don't want to give you that information on your transactional account uh, so that I can make an app that would help you save better, even if it's a few cents a day. Um, and uh, that that's the sort of uh, pushback that uh, fintech, that's what we are, we're a fintech company on top of solar. That's really the way that we look at it. We're the kind of guys that enable the disruptors to challenge the incumbents. So we want to cuddle up to the disruptors. Well, um, crowdsource funding um, is scalable to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, once you get to a certain size, crowdsource funding of anything seems to run out of um, steam. So there, there's it does, it does really um, skew um, to, to really level the playing field. That's what we're trying to do. We'll go to the right side. <laughs> so ultimately, once you reach a uh, point of sustainability, what's your business model? Where's the yeah. where's your revenue coming from? So ultimately, I think the sustainability question is, is going to be a couple decades. We hope to, to assist in providing a, a decarbonization and, a, and an economic incentive to decarbonize. So after that, it's really information and information arbitrage. The whole company becomes all about the data and then all about the finance. 
our company will take those little chips and we'll sell those as an OEM license to China, to Korean, to Japanese, to Indian vendors. And they can, they can vendor finance solar farms. That's really our end game. It's not about um, providing this service uh, from soup to nuts for all con uh, community energy projects. Our project is really to make this an embedded service in every solar panel. So is that a, a, so is that a single license fee or, or do you include particular um, For us it's a single license fee and uh, if you're a developer you can create apps that then you would clip the ticket. So we're like an app store for solar and energy analytics. So that's ultimately what will, what will happen. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the infrastructure that's required to actually deploy the solution in the market? Sure. I understand a lot of solutions on blockchain at the moment are obviously solving for a massive you know, um, issue in the, in the, in the kind of scale, but there tends to be a lack, lack of infrastructure around it. To, yep. So, yeah, that, that Good question. as well. Yeah. So we, we are a blockchain infrastructure company. We don't do blockchains for uh, enterprise. We're, we're trying to do blockchain infrastructure for an industry. Um, this requires a harmonization. When I was talking about the SCADA and trying to make sure that our devices can talk to industry side devices, so the grid side, and then also interoperate with the consumer side. So there's a range of um, devices that need to be created to make this ecosystem kind of rock and roll. We need to have a whole band, not just one bass guitar and a drum, right? So the, the sensor becomes one of the critical elements for measuring what, what the heck is going on with that device. So we, we're trying to provide this point of um, truth so that device can provide its own behavioral uh, history. So if we're going to put our device in a smart plug, that will know what's happened, um, how many times it's been used, what sort of current and, and voltage it, it's had during the day. And that sort of ecosystem needs to be built up. Now there'll be a range of difficult ways to do this as a retrofit project uh, for homes. That'll be the hardest way to do it. The easiest way would be greenfield fit outs in townhouses and uh, in gated communities like Delphin, Lendlease is doing in Brangaroo. You know, they, they aspire to do this work because they know if they do it on the plan and they, they invite the vendors in to participate, then that's where they'll, they'll get the engagement. So we see uh, partnerships with uh, battery and storage devices, um, not just um, lithium, but uh, other uh, flow, flow batteries. Uh, also the inverter um, story also needs a, a little bit of help to provide the calibration on the DC side of the inverter compared to the AC side of the inverter, there's losses all through there. And no one really knows what's happening with a lot of these microgrids, um, you know, what's happening on the, behind the meter. So we want to provide that, that accountability. Um, in, a, in a way, it's a uh, professional engagement of an industry that we're doing at an industry level. So we need to work with those smart meter vendors, the sub-meter vendors, and the smart device vendors. So that's, that's really the other side of our business besides the electrons and the data, we're really an OEM engagement. We, we help these devices have a life and get, get um, designed. And sorry, sorry, when do you think um, the solution would actually be ready to be deployed mm -hmm. to the market? What's the timeline So I've built these little devices before for defense. Um, they can now be a lot smaller. Um, it's about a 18 month cycle, so we, we would see our first deployment of these, these are called TOSIMs, they're a pre-Zigbee device. Um, those will happen in the next three months on, on various different solar farms. And then we'll have Zigbee devices, they're available off the shelf out of China, and, and they can be quickly iterated, put into cases that are 3D printed. We plan to do very quick iterations with Zigbee devices. Um, then we have a dedicated chip from uh, a Nordic company, and. Uh, that's uh, going to be proprietary, and uh, we're, we're negotiating access for, for that chipset. And uh, that'll be where we make the custom silicon in partnership with the solar panel vendors that we hope to convince in time to accept those, those chips so that we get the, the volume that we need. The, the whole problem with designing hardware is that you need volume in order to meet the price. And so if you flame out and don't get the volume or the uptake, then the, the whole thing was a very nice bit of PowerPoint. Um, but you, you didn't get to market. So um, my expertise has been doing that with Wi-Fi chips. 
I started with Wi-Fi chips the size of my laptop in a backpack with a big whip antenna with a very heavy DC battery for field communications for, for troop radio. And now a Wi-Fi chip is the size of your, your pinky. It also includes Bluetooth and home automation. So this is the, the kind of thing that we've, we've been through. Um, and yeah, we'll make mistakes, but now we with 3D printing, printing and additive um, manufacturing, we can quickly iterate and, and hope to be ahead of the curve. So it's very hard to do a hardware startup in Australia. No one will give us the risk money for a three million dollar burn on hardware because that's basically what we're doing the crowd sale for. Tell them it's a mine. Yeah, you tell them it's a mine. <laughs> it is. We're mining the sun. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, so with this particular hardware, it, it's got certain protocols in it. Yes. Uh, so. How open are those protocols? So, for example, your particular company, you made this <coughs> widget that ideally gets embedded into the solar panel as it comes out. Sure. Of so the patent is public domain. So the sensor and the, and this cryptographic root of truth will be public domain. Um, we plan to, when we do our crowd sale, we'll open source the design, our first design. The patent protects the implementation. So in a way, by open sourcing the design, we're showing the industry all of our wares to say, come and play with us. It's kind of like what Tesla does with some of their, their services. However, under the hood, we actually plan to have our own proprietary chips that do the best, wit, best of breed sort of sensor networks we need for very dense solar farms. We could have a million panels in a number of hectares, so we're going to have to have the density of a million sensors across 50 hectares, how is that going to happen? Because there's no smart city protocol that does that right now, except one or two vendors in Europe that have already figured that out. So we, this kind of, um, we know where the industry is now, we're comfortable to open source that. We know what we can do with Zigbee chips, and that will be basically open source, and Zigbee is open source. But then our, our target is to do this with high, high density, very performance sensors, and that's kind of, um, a secret sauce that we're going to engage with them and they're all driven by volume. They only want to talk to us if we can do millions of sensors. They won't even pick up the phone if I'm doing 10,000 sensors. So th this is the challenge. Yeah. And so where are you up to with platform? Mm -hmm. So we're using the Ethereum platform um, from a, a blockchain. Um, it, with the Energy Web Foundation, we're using um, a version of, of the system called Parity. So the Energy Web Foundation has blockchain systems already working everywhere around the world. Some of these licensees are no small small uh, kind of company. So TEPCO in, in Japan has got Ethereum working, not in a lab, but in, in a community where they, they're using Parity um, as a client in order to do these transactions. Our sensors provide the communications and the data input to that Parity client. And that'll be a solid state, it's basically an Android phone running this client, hooked up to the inverter with proper isolation and industrial hardening for the temperatures of Australia, right? So from minus 30 to plus 80 or maybe plus 90, the industrial spec um, Android phone. But those Android chipsets are already out there. They're cheap as heck to really buy. For the, for the, the compute is easy. The storage will be a little bit more expensive, about 30, 30 bucks a terabyte for, for storage. Now that's a lot of interval data and a terabyte. Yeah. yeah. So it's really you, leveraging the Android phone economy in Shenzhen and making it for smart electronics. Yes? I'm sorry? Who are, who are they? Institute or government will against you or Well, I, I already think some, some of the incumbents will um, not like to have a, um, a regulatory challenge as far as uh, we, we, we need some relief as far as uh, transport of electrons. We, we'd like to see apportioned access to the grid being charged. I can measure it. Why can't I pay to send electrons 10 meters rather than sending them 10 kilometers? Why do I have to pay a step function for network access to Osgrid? Um, and I'd, I'd rather have a, a portioned access because I'll, I'll know where I'm sending it and I know um, where it was sourced. So I think that we need more elegant um, policies around grid, grid access and, and the transport uh, of electrons. I really do think that um, 
there, there's a range of people with their arms folded on, on the need for a, a carbon type accounting. And uh, I really think we, we need some leadership in that. So we're, we're looking at ways to offer fixed green PPAs to corporates where other people don't really care. They just want energy at, at the cheapest price. So we'd like to be able to provide that energy uh, with a green signal and provide that uh, certainty. So I think there's, there's a range of uh, policies that, that need to be reworked. Um, I think neighborhood uh, access and providing easements for energy, um, having private copper um, to allow transport between buildings. Right now there's no way that a building um, site owner can, or let's call it a master plan, have private copper between one building premises to another. So we, we'd like to see how that, those sorts of rules can be exercised or a little bit of regulatory relief. It's a very complicated bit of a kit. There's 1,800 some pages in the electricity laws of Australia, and that's, that's not my expertise. Yeah, Piers. Just on that, um, Speak up, please. Just on that, so if I'm looking at building over in the city, was it the green uh, PPA? Yeah. Providers, yeah. Um, it's a great measure for your technology, but is that purpose you get it? Because it's going across. Yeah, because you're, you're transiting across three other networks and they have assets that they want to be paid for. In South Australia, the South Australian grid is owned by La Caching. He's a Hong Kong billionaire. Um, they supercharge that grid. It's gold plated, right? Um, he wants to make sure he gets his click. Um, and the, the WA grid is owned by a different Hong Kong billionaire. I, th I think really the, what will suffer with this kind of you know, distributed generation will be the grid. Who's going to pay for the grid? I think it will be um, federalized again, again. Ultimately, the grid, we need those comments, and it's going to suffer a death of a thousand cuts um, to, to use it efficiently. So it, we need to have that lighthouse, um, you know, that, that commons um, that everyone benefits from. The Sticking when you're talking about the disruption of the time, a, a year ago the government decided that they would cut the price of license fees for commercial television stations because nobody's no one's so using them. People are no longer watching it. Yeah. I don't own a TV. I just YouTube and use you know I view. But that's taken uh, television started in Australia in 1956, so that's taken 60 years. Yeah. For that, uh, and probably the last 10 years is when they've been stopped being. Money so that type of digital disruption, right? So, yeah, so if you look when decade, the, there's a decade before some of these things were even looked at. Correct, yeah. So we're, we're looking at multiple decades. So if you look at when the internet came out, the guy out of Boston called Nicholas Negroponte um, basically said, if your job description has the word agent in it, you're going to be eaten by the web, right? The web will basically replace what is travel agents, right? And we all know that we... I'm not sure if anyone here would, would use a travel agent only for a complex booking with a family on a special holiday, right, you know, where you don't want anything to fuck up. <laughs> so that, that's when you use a travel agent. But now there's bots and everything else that, that does that, right? So energy will be kind of apportioned and shared and uh, accumulated and treated like an internet packet. It'll be wrapped up and used the same way. Uh, just thinking in terms of the logistics of your commercial survival, the, um, there's a long... If, if a government in Australia cannot even face itself, hmm. let alone its community, on making some pretty straightforward decisions about technological change and yeah. energy production... We, we just need pockets of innovation. Australia is 2% of the world's GDP. We can showcase this, and then we're going to export the hell out of this. Okay, I'm not here to to, to do all all my stuff only in Australia, right? I've had to export myself to Silicon Valley before, to Italy before. I've had to do all that myself. So you know, ultimately, we have to go where the market is and and where the needs are, right? Yeah. So I'm just quite quite clear on <clears throat> one one breath you're saying this thing's got a you know, 50, 20 year out. But at some point, you've got to uh, you've got to reach a, a, a point of sustainable <coughs> flow. Sure. Um, where is that at? Is that at a million sensors across uh, 
Uh, oh, look, we, we think the company <coughs> with uh, half a dozen solar farms and a range, maybe a dozen communities, can, can do very well as a smart. We're a new type of smart meter company. That's what we really are. We're a smart meter company that provides information arbitrage to market traders. So if you have <coughs> a clean energy derivatives company, what, what do they do? Okay, they're a bunch of ex-MAC bankers that want to take contracts for difference on energy futures and provide you a guarantee as a solar farm owner operator, a way that you can enter confidently into a dispatch agreement. And if you make a shortfall, they have the product that will help save your bacon. Okay, so yeah. I mean, the, the, cap, the capital required you know, is in relative terms pretty minimal. Yeah. And then your operating costs above that once you've got an installed base. Um, Infinitesimal. Uh, yeah. And, and if we design the sensors into the panels, it, it all comes out of the box. Yeah. Ultimately, the vision is that, you know, IKEA, who is selling solar panels now in, in the UK, you snap together a, a 30 or, or maybe only 10 solar panels for the granny flat back home, and each panel is like a little self-aware Lego block. It knows its neighbor, it can communicate over wireless, it knows what it's producing and says, okay, connect it up, done. And so the, this is what's going to happen with IoT devices. Um, the, if you're dealing with an asset that is basically like money, uh, um, that's what energy is. We, we see this as a universal measure, measure that, that is um, very important to most people's budget, right? So if you, if you look at the bill shock problem, the, there's a real opportunity to treat it like money. And if we're treating it like money, then it better be secured like money. And that's, that's what we're really doing with these systems. There's a whole bunch of energy fraud in the marketplaces. There's companies that have listed on the stock exchange in New York with uh, solar farms in China. No one ever checked if they were built. Someone did a few quarters later, and uh, you know, there was just an empty paddock. There was no proof of existence of the solar panel. Right? There, was, there was no hard proof, and that, that's the very simple thing that we can help uh, for it as well. Keep, uh, uh, keep, keep solar panel uh, people honest. Well, yeah. Um, well, he, here's an incentive for you. My, my guy who does uh, my guy who does uh, uh, seconds on solar panels. He's not here today, but we can create a, a market. We create a, a way to have a secondary market. There's a secondary market for your iPhone. There's sure as hell going to be one for your solar panel. Yeah. Thank you very much, Leon. A, a very interesting presentation, um, and I think just reflecting on it, I think um, although the, the government inertia is frustrating, I think it's increasingly being driven by um, the private sector in this space. So Australia has one of the biggest um, deployments of domestic solar panels in the world by um, by population. Um, and we're increasingly seeing storage and also large-scale solar. It's arguably too little too late, but I think um, the move is there, and it's uh, interesting to hear from disruptive com companies like Solara, which are um, very likely to play a big role in the future energy system. Um, just a quick reminder, this is bit we've been hosted by the Smart Energy Council, so we're a forum for bringing um, industry participants together to network and um, share ideas. Um, our events are held on the last Tuesday of every month, so the next one will be, be towards the end of July and we'll send a note to everyone um, in the coming weeks. Thank you all for joining us. I'm sure Leon will stick around to have a drink with everyone um, and answer any more questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.